people in. So, guys, thanks very much. We just had a bit of a, a laptop conniption just as we started, but uh, I think we're uh, I think we're okay now. So, reality capture for the civil industry, as you know, Civil Survey Solutions has uh, has, has focused on the civil industry through survey, sort of engineering, uh, infrastructure, uh, and so when reality capture uh, first came, uh, you know, to me. Uh, it was certainly more in the building side of, you know, with the uh, architecture or what they call used to call scan to BIM. Um, but certainly, as I uh, as I went on through the uh, various ways of processing and capturing, there's a huge amount of use for across in the, the civil industry side, and we'll try and pull some of those out as we go. So point clouds being the the obvious uh, uh, format that a lot of this reality capture uh, gets processed in and and, and viewed in. But we might um, talk around those as well. Uh, and I'm just looking for, there we go. That's much better. So I'm Matt Rumbelow. Uh, so I'm the education manager uh, and uh, training coordinator for Civil Survey Solutions. Uh, most of you on this call should, uh, should know us, but I'll do a little spiel as well. And we also have, um, and thankfully, uh, sometime at night is uh, Eric Ritchie. Uh, and Eric's and I met uh, when I was doing some work with a Leica reseller, uh, Eric was with Leica, and then uh, previously to that, well, we'll we'll, we'll explain that as we go. Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, he's been involved in reality capture for as long as it was called that, probably, uh, and probably longer. Uh, uh, which is youthful looks, uh, you know, doesn't quite um, doesn't quite gel with that. But anyway, housekeeping. So all attendees are in mute. Um, we are recording this session. Uh, we are using the Q&A panel um, and um, we will answer the questions live if we can or we will summarise them at the end and certainly we'll be providing everyone with a follow-up email um, redacted heavily uh, and uh, and a webinar, to uh, a recording, I should say, uh, for this event. Now, the other thing I thought I'd put in here, um, and it'll make sense uh, shortly, um, is, uh, is our general safe harbour statement. Uh, we are going to be talking a little bit about future um, products or at least future ideas of products uh, and maybe some uh, future roadmaps. Uh, they are our best summations. Uh, this is not an official uh, uh, roadmap discussion. So anything to do with that or any purchasing decisions uh, should not be made with, with this information in mind. Okay, me. Well, uh, so I am a BIM advocate, probably the best way to say it. Started off uh, in architecture and construction. Uh, move through with uh, with almost all, all the players where it comes to uh, Trimble and Leica uh, and Autodesk resellers uh, and worked uh, for a few photogrammetry capture specialists. So that aerial perspective uh, was, uh, was, was, was quite important and showed me where that sits within this whole decision-making process, uh, governmental uh, and also, you know, in, in the case of developers. Um, so, yeah, a, a much... Um, maybe overlooked even uh, area uh, with a huge amount of um, increased resolution and increased capabilities as well just in the last few years. Civil Survey Solutions is your civil industry partner uh, and we have 15 years of, of dedicated experience in that area uh, as well as um, specialist tool sets that we, we have in-house developers uh, to make the running of some of these programs, especially something like Civil 3D, uh, easier uh, and, and inform to uh, your requirements and, and standards. Uh, we also have a training uh, arm, which I manage and coordinate, uh, and we have a, a best of, of, of both, really. We have skilled in-house trainers who can teach either online or on-premise uh, in our custom offering, or we have online uh, content, um, especially with our, our, our own program, Civil Site Design, as well as partnering with the, um, the expertise that, that get globally training. So for uh, either pr either just general uh, updating of your skills or maybe pre-project, pre-start, uh, we can uh, look after and tailor packages uh, to yourself. Mr. Eric Ritchie. So uh, Eric comes to us with uh, a lot of experience within the reality capture, especially in the, the usability side. I mean, you could certainly say that it has been the usability of a re reality capture, which has really made, I mean, it helps when the, when the actual hardware gets smaller and better, but the understanding of it, how people process it, how they can uh, uh, you know, uh, 
integrate it to their workflows. That's been key, and that a lot of that work is is Eric's. So uh, Eric um, was working with now I forget the name of the all all point. All point systems. Yep, that was our uh, startup back in the day. Uh, I want to say twenty startups. early twenty tens. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, exactly. No, so uh, a startup of uh, a veteran uh, and uh, did the right thing because obviously with startups you either you know make it yourself or get someone to buy you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second, the latter happened. So Autodesk acquired All Point along with um, Alice Labs and became the recap that you now know and love today. Uh, and uh, I think that's a, that's a sensational um, look into how this all came about. I certainly remember when Recap started, everyone was like, well, I don't even understand how this thing, <laughs> I'm just talking about usability, but it didn't look like an Autodesk product. You know, it, it looked more like a Microsoft, um, what was that Square? Uh, uh, UI? Yeah, I, I think it was, uh, what, what was it called? Metro, Metro, Metro UI. Metro UI. So this yeah. is a thing that didn't even look like a survey tool. Um, but for a lot of those users, that was great. That's what they wanted. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get into this again a bit later. But after that, uh, Eric uh, then spent some time with Leica and was around for the release of the BLK. So that's why I put mm -hmm. a little, little BLK underneath him to remind him. And, uh, and also around for the release of the, uh, the BLK uh, apps, which some are, some are still here, some aren't. We might t touch on that as well. Um, so it wouldn't be a, a, an Autodesk presentation without a video. Uh, I'll play this, get the feeling for the, for the, the session, and then we're going to run it uh, a bit like a, a, a podcast, even though Eric and I have never been on the podcast. play this one uh, just yet. Eric, um, welcome. Thank you for uh, volunteering. Um, he's probably too humble to say, but uh, Eric has two lifetime NDAs. I don't know anyone who's <laughs> got one. So uh, he will tell us as much as he humanly can, and then we'll delete the rest. <laughs> yeah, you know, I can I can scare, uh, share a couple of tidbits here and there, but but yeah, of course, having having come from both Autodesk and Leica, you know, I I can't disclose secrets or or such, but you know, I'll try to give you a little little color commentary here and there. Do you feel like you were you know, you were there at the moment where um, you know these magnificent technology still depending on on what people use it for now, but you know, the, the, the revolutionary recap and the BLK came together, that must have been uh, uh, pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, especially uh, in the early days of recap, even before the BLK came into the picture, uh, one of the things we were trying to do, and I, I mentioned this to Matt the other day when we were chatting, was one of our goals was to try to make reality capture and using laser scanners as easy for a user as as uh, digital photography is so we wanted to you know really take these these devices that were seen as as complex survey equipment and and put them in the hands of of users that could then you know start to come up with interesting things to do with them so you know matt mentioned usability and all of that that's really one of the core principles back in the early recap days was we wanted to make this easy for users you know at the time we kind of joked that registering in Cyclone was uh, registration by spreadsheet because, you know, it, it, you didn't have a lot of visual feedback. It was a lot of numbers. And so, you know, with Recap, it was really trying to get into this, this ease of use, targetless registration and all of those sorts of things to really kind of, 
you know, bridge that gap and, and bring this technology to more people. So you mentioned the target list registration. So Recap was known um, for that ability, and I think maybe even Faro jumped in first, mm -hmm. being like a direct connection. But it would be looking for planar shapes which you could identify in multiple uh, uh, pickups or scenes. And yeah, so more more than even just planar features, um, you know, the geometry of the scene in general. I mean, planars are are easy to find, but even you know where where you have corners or or objects in general, you know, whether it's a pipe or a cylinder, you know, those are uh, geometric uh, objects that can be detected, and then you know shapes match together. Yeah, incredible. But I can also see, and especially probably when you got to Leica, that it's a bit of a black box. There, I can absolutely. See I know the people who were saying, "Oh, this can't be trusted." Um, was there an enormous jump from the the startup? We can do anything now to a very measured, pardon the pun. Actually, no, I'll keep that in. Um, <laughs> company like Leica. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Leica. You know, the tagline is when it has to be right. So, so Leica has a storied history of of survey equipment, and you know, going back to the the eighteen hundreds with um, uh, Vild uh, back in the day. And so, yeah, you know, very much Leica is focused on precision, accuracy. You know, making sure that that data is is good. And you know, one of the stories I shared with Matt was uh, I had a, a police officer from Sydney come to me at a presentation and said, love recap, can't use it because I, I don't have those precision numbers behind it. So it's absolutely a balance. You know, what one customer, you know, absolutely has to have to complete a job, somebody else may not care so much about. Yeah, and, and that was certainly my experience as I was sort of hinting. Um, I work for a Leica reseller. They spend a lot of time, a lot of money establishing you know, uh, millimeter accuracy or sub millimeter, depending. Um, and to bring on a, a kit like this, which wasn't actually meant for surveyors, it's meant for architects and other mm -hmm. people, was uh, was yeah, that was the paradigm shift. I think. Well, I know, and um, it created a whole whole swirl. It was good to be. Uh, I mean, I'm still. You were saying that anecdotally, you know, they're still uh, can't can't make enough. They're still selling, literally, like um, hotcakes. Oh yeah, the the BLK devices, yeah, definitely uh, have been a, a huge success, and uh, you know continue to be very very popular in the market for sure. I'll just play this little video. Uh, this is actually uh, with uh, Richie's uh, manager uh, and not Jurgen, but someone similar. Um, uh, and... Yeah, that's that's Jurgen Jurgen Meyer okay. is sitting oh, in the middle. Yeah. He's now the president of uh, of uh, Lego Geosystems for the scanning division and all of that. And there's also a guy called Thad Webster for, for those who know their BIM um, from Case, who then was acquired by WeWork. Uh, and yes, the rest is unfortunately a sad history, but we'll, um, this is how they reacted to, uh, well, let's assume it's how they reacted. I'm sure there was a couple of, couple of um, edits. Our group provides all the laser scanning for WeWork buildings, so we scan uh, pre-construction and support the design teams. The BLK is incredibly tiny, small, will make it cheaper for us to travel with it. All those things are huge positives. If our designers in the field will use Recap Mobile, then they can hand us process scans instead of 100 scans that we now have to process, so they'll be ready right then. And that means we can do more scanning, we can up the volume so we can scan multiple times over the course of a project instead of just pre-construction. Scanning is the only way to capture that breadth of information. You can't do it any other way. The operation is pretty simple. Just touch new scan. So this is the live view. So you see the photos coming in real time. So this is nice. It's kind of a just a really quick. As soon as it starts, you can see what you're getting. So the other thing that was revolutionary, especially for Leica, is this use of the iPad and the use of another system being Apple and all the things that probably in the in the background was difficult uh, about that. But uh, yeah, so I've had these situations where, where people would try to find the strongest, hardest case for the iPad because they were almost, you know, dodging concrete trucks in the middle of a, uh, middle of a site 
um, and thinking, why on earth is this on an iPad? No, it doesn't make any sense. Well, and it's it's funny because in the very early days, pre recap, uh, I won't I won't name names, but one of my old uh, colleagues looked at me when I wanted to to uh, make a point cloud viewer for the iPad. He's like, nobody's going to take an iPad out to a construction site, and you know, here we are today. So that was uh, I still remind that remind him of that occasionally when I see him. But uh, yeah, my how things have changed. But it obviously freed up a lot of the processing to the device. It, it, it keyed you into this sort of app world, which was good or bad, depending on how both companies wanted to, to, to run with that and expand on that as they went. Um, it meant that we as a reseller had to start selling iPads, which we'd never done before, um, but they beautifully let us resell them. Um, so, yeah, but they did they did have an issue with heat. And, oh, God, in the middle of a... a you know, I did a little bit of a pickup for a, a local a developer here, um, a site site construction type, and uh, it just overheated and went went to hell. So uh, yeah, they were. You could see where they had a, had a had a niche, and probably you know forty five degrees on a on a on a rocky side is not one of them. Forward. So here we go. Um, this is my very quick attempt. To sort of position uh, recap now uh, in in this Autodesk world, uh, and we can go into detail, uh, uh, you know, more in, in later uh, episodes. But I remember when uh, the Point Cloud sort of became an add-on to AutoCAD. It was really quite basic. It was probably a an E fifty seven, if if that, or an XYZ. Re uh, Revit got another type of format that came in. Uh, it had its own issues when you were trying to uh, bring in a, an enormous files, as most architects do. They'll they'll just try and bring in the whole site, not understand. Um, so bringing in this 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 I won't call it third party now because it's part of the universe or part of the cycle. But bringing in recap as its centerpiece made sense. And and was that what was always the 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 envisage of how recap was going to work, or that it evolved that way? Yeah, it kind of evolved that way. I mean, uh, as you as you mentioned, you know, early on, some of these products like Auto AutoCAD and some of the others actually did have some rudimentary capabilities to bring in data on their own. Um, and then once you know, once these three companies were acquired, that you know, then were were merged to form, uh, you know, this Voltron of, of <laughs> recap, uh, you know, was uh, we, we tried to play on some of the strengths and then it was, okay, now we have this thing in the, in the whole ecosystem, you know, let's make it so that the same, you know, the same reality capture data, this, this RCP file that it became um, slots into each of these products because, you know, really with, with Autodesk and, and selling, um, you know, the, the portfolios or the suites or, or, you know, whatever, whatever the, the groupings are called on any given day, uh, you know, it was really like, Let's let's take this data and let's just make it useful throughout the workflow, whichever product it's in. So yeah, recap then became kind of the core of you know the reality capture experience within the Autodesk portfolio. Yeah, no, and 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 made sense. Did did the RCP file, RCS, RCP, did did it have anything anything else that really, you know, you hung your hat on? Was it hyper compressed? I mean, it seemed like there were four or five formats that are all vying for. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, so as as with anything, you know, there were there were strengths and weaknesses of of any approach. I mean, anybody who's who's been using these for a long time can tell you, you know, like that support folder. Sometimes that can get a little mm -hmm. dodgy if uh, if you lose track of that or or you know muck with something. But um, in general, you know, RCP reality capture project and RCS reality capture scan, and then uh, I, I don't remember if it's still around or not, but we also had an RCM, a reality capture mesh. Um, I don't know if it's still uh, called that or uh, if it's just embedded now. Um, but yeah, we, we had all these, these disparate assets around and, and really um, this was, this was an approach to kind of keep that all together in a sense. So we had, 
Um, you know, early on, we had the, as I said, the, the point clouds. We also had a, a meshing system and the photogrammetry and all of that. And as we went along, it was really about trying to, to merge those together. And, you know, we were pushing for, hey, we've got all this different stuff. Let's bring it into one place and then, you know, let the users kind of leverage that throughout their their systems. I mean, Leica has done something similar with their their and, LGS and file yeah. And, yeah. and all of that. Um, but but yeah, RCP within within the Autodesk ecosystem was really you know uh, the preferred way to to do all of that. And you mentioned that there was always, maybe not always, but there certainly is mm -hmm. uh, an OEM API type approach that other hardware manufacturers especially or software can be involved in RCP and that's yeah so uh I I can't speak with any authority on that just because I've I've been you know gone from Autodesk for a number of years now but but yeah we had a we had an SDK um that others were using I mean to this day even uh, uh Leica has has mm -hmm. RCP export and and you know, Pharaoh and some of the others. Um, so, you know, that that still seems to be around. Again, I, I'm not up to speed on all the details of what that, you know, partner relationship looks like and, you know, how a new uh, company might interact with it or, you know, what have you. But yeah, but yeah there, there are tools available, you know, or could be made available most likely um, to, to create, you know, RCPs, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's that's great. So with that in mind, then, learning the recap uh, is beneficial to this, the whole workflow, even if understanding just how to bring yeah. the things in, what you're looking for, what type of project works best, and, you know, the idea of maybe if you have to split projects up or not, that's still mm -hmm. a bit of a, an issue depending on capacity, um, how then to export them. Uh, so there is, there is quite, a, quite of a trick, well, not a trick, it's quite of a, a, a layered approach to how, how you might integrate uh, these point clouds then directly into the design tools and the ones that our sort of audience and, and customers, Civil 3D and Revit, um, you know, probably have different approaches as well. Well, and, you know, one of the things about Recap as well is you can import from other miscellaneous data sources. Now, it's not every format out there, but regardless of what software package you're using, whether you're using Cyclone or Cyclone Register 360, Faro Scene, et cetera, most of them, uh, even the ones that don't directly export an RCP, can export to some sort of an in interchange format like an E57, uh, et cetera, that can then be imported into Recap. So, regardless, you know, there are still ways to get that data in. And, and like I said, you know, even in like the Leica days, I, I owned the portfolio of, of plugins for, you know, all of these um, various products, you know, AutoCAD and Revit, et cetera, to bring in, you know, point cloud data uh, via, <laughs> via a different plugin, but at the end of the day, still getting, you know, that data into your, your workhorse um, packages to do your design work, et cetera. Fantastic. This was just a, I should have put an RIP here, uh, but for those who, who don't know, uh, the, the I thought it was a bloody good app uh, of the Autodesk Recap app um, went, met, met end of life. Um, yeah. It meant that uh, by this stage, Leica had created their own app, which had some pretty good things in it, to be honest, as well. Um, and Eric has to say that because he was doing it. But um, so, yeah, obviously at some point, though, uh, do you think within reason you can say there was two apps that ever work or it was just, just what happened with the resources at the time that the recap app had to stop? Yeah, I mean, you know, in in some ways, yeah, there there was certainly overlap. I mean, uh, as a as a piece of hardware from Leica, of course, Leica had to have, you know, their own capabilities to to manage and and utilize the hardware. So, you know, there was always going to be an a, a Leica app. And on the recap side, you know, having having an application to manage a piece of hardware that you know, that Autodesk didn't produce wasn't necessarily the right allocation of resources either. So, you know, I think it made sense for both parties to kind of focus on their strengths. And, and yeah, you know, 
approaches change over time. Um, you know, there were there were certainly agreements in the early days in in regards to to marketing and upkeep and and everybody had a part to play. But I think it really made sense in the end that you know Autodesk could focus on um, utilizing the data and Leica would focus on you know the actual capture process and um, you know managing the hardware and things like that. So I, I think it was really you know, probably in the best interest of both parties. No, and then, of course, what happens, what did happen with the Leica app is it's bloody clever as well with the, with the registration, uh, with the ability of uh, even even rotation is an enormous advantage. Uh, so some of those things uh, worked out really well. Mm -hmm. So speaking of the BLK in practice, so here's one of our clients, Miller Merrigan. Uh, they use the, the, the BLK they do land survey, and initially you're probably going to think, how do you do that with a BLK? Well, they also do other buildings and other uh, uh, features. Um, and I'm actually, I know they've got a larger uh, scanner fleet for uh, for some of the, the the bigger surveys. But they did a, a post uh, came out yesterday, um, so it was great to be able to include that here. Um, it is the sturdiest set of legs I've ever seen on a BLK. But then again, the ones that came out with the BLK in the in the bag were terrible. So, you know, I would probably err to this one than the ones that came out of the bag. I've got so many shopping stories uh, where they've just collapsed, they fell over, no one saw them, someone walked over it. Yeah, terrible. And and just to add in, for those who don't know, there is a tripod adapter too to take that BLK mount and put it on, you know, anything else. Yes, true. You didn't have to. Yes, exactly. But that came to be... Um, Pretty hard to get for a yeah. while. So uh, yeah, it was uh, it was another another piece of kit, but um, <laughs> you know, definitely exists and for a reason. Uh, exactly. So another one of our clients, GeoServe. Now this is actually a video they put together with the RTC three hundred and sixty. Now we haven't we haven't talked about the model uh, uh, progression yet, but this is a probably a good time to to do it. Um, and the amount of this is looking here at the the extractions they do, and the extraction being you know, key for a lot of that civil work as opposed to the point cloud itself. Um, although perhaps, you know, this is now, you know, changing again. But uh, we'll just play this one through from, from GeoServe. Hi, I'm Doug from GeoServe and I'm a 3D scanning and survey technician. The advantage of using 3D scanning as opposed to traditional methods is that you get a 3D representation of the space that you're in. This means that clients that previously relied on 2D methods of traditional surveying are now able to use a 3D model which is immersive and interactive. The scanners that we use can fire up to 2 million points per second. What that means is that we can show what we're scanning in extremely high detail and it's accurate to the millimetre. We recognise that 3D scanning is becoming an industry standard and we are constantly striving for excellence through ongoing training. What I enjoy about working at GeoServe is working in a team to solve complex problems and provide practical solutions to the construction industry. So here we are, not not that long since the BLK had come out. Now we're with the RTC. Now we're with almost industry acceptance that this type of quick, fast capture, you know, it's got better legs. Uh, it looks like a, you know, a scanner. Uh, people can run around confidently with a with a hardened iPad. And some of the RTC is is really picking up that industry level capture. What um. And of course, it, it still utilized or ben really benefited from the fact that that app, which which grew up through BL the BLK, was was a was the same app for the for the RTC. And one of the things, you know, just from a civil perspective as well, that uh, people may not be immediately aware of, uh, the RTC was actually the first Leica scanner to have built-in um, GPS as well, uh, so it actually can locate itself. Ah, oh, yeah, I actually just saw that in some of the setups on, on screen, but we were told it wasn't overly uh, great to begin with um, as far as being able to then geo, and we, we will talk about geolocating uh, clouds, and in a car park like this, I don't think it's going to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's roughly equivalent to, you know, cell phone GPS, um, you know, yeah. it's it's not it's not an RTK, that's for sure. But Exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, no, so good work there again from from GeoServe. Um, now this is an interesting one. I don't know if you've actually you might have seen this one, Eric, on your ventures down. 
But uh, we have a, a power authority um, that have, like we would imagine, enormous amounts of assets uh, to, to digitize and to understand. Uh, and so they put together a pretty slick, slick video when they sort of first got hold of the BLK. We're using new laser scanning technology to take photographs but also measurements that maps out a 3D model of the substations. From that information, we can then identify assets um, and, and do an audit of all the nameplates and asset management sort of information. There's a few reasons why we're scanning the equipment. Firstly, by creating a digital model of our equipment, it minimises the need to actually access um, these high voltage areas. So it makes it safer for staff and contractors. Secondly, with high accuracy scans, it can help us do engineering designs from the office and minimise field trips and also plan for future upgrades, making sure equipment fits indoors, what equipment has to be decommissioned, what equipment's coming in. And thirdly, we're looking at creating virtual reality models of the buildings and we can use that for stakeholder engagement, for clash detection and also engineering design reviews. We're looking to do a holistic capture across the zone subs on the network. And the ultimate aim there is to open that up to sort of everybody in the, within the business. So not only asset management or engineering, but anybody or any business unit within the business that wants access to that information, rather than having to come down, sort of put PPE on, get access to an area, there might be construction going on. Straight away, they can just log onto their computer, similar to Google Earth or Street View, bring up the site, um, and do what they need to do to do their job better. So whether that's taking a measurement, looking at the condition of an asset, or sort of planning for future works. We scan, and then we create sort of a virtual world. Uh, probably not doing Minecraft just yet, um, but what we are exploring is whether we can use it for online inductions and training. So again, to help uh, induct people into dangerous areas, um, show them hazards, but also sort of on, ongoing induction programs. So rather than sitting down, doing a textbook exam, ticking the boxes, we can actually use these 3D worlds to essentially walk people through the environment, um, get them to interact with the equipment um, prior to ever being on site. The adoption of new technology is critical at the moment to help us keep up to date with the way we design and upgrade the network. The reason why we don't just keep on doing it the same way, same way we have for 50 years is I guess the world's changing around us and there's an expectation to keep costs down, to be more productive, more efficient, do more with less. So adopting new technology helps with that paradigm, ensuring that we can still keep high quality engineering outcomes, community engagement, keep the costs under control. So is that the, the sort of user you, you thought you might get when you started on the, the, the startup? To be, to be honest with you, my initial customer, um, you know, in the startup days was actually uh, vehicle based scanning. So, you know, I was I was processing uh, bridge measurements and, and that sort of thing. So I actually did start scanning on the civil side before we started thinking about, um, you know, in interiors and construction sites. But but definitely, you know, as things kind of progress towards, like I said, the, the targetless registration and, you know, point cloud viewers and all of that, even pre-recap. Yeah, it was a lot of factory settings and, um, you know, asset uh, management sorts of, you know, automotive companies and, and things like that. So, yeah, they they would talk to us all the time about, you know, workflows like this where they wanted to tag assets or or virtually walk through a site or, you know, um, redo a, a plant layout, things like, like that. So absolutely, um, you know, these were things that were at least kind of on our radar, but but as with all things, the more you do anything uh, and the more you interact with customers, the more people have it in their hands, they start to show you things that they've come up with that, you know, shock in some cases or generally just kind of surprise you. You go, huh, never thought of that. That's really cool. So absolutely. Um, some of this was, you know, was on the radar in the early days, but some of it absolutely uh, evolved by leaps and bounds from there. No, fantastic. And likewise, we've got a, a local power authority 
doing similar uh, uh, work, but also in, engaging. And I think PowerCore do, uh, you know, the aerial light up, which is that little graphic to the bottom there. Um, and, you know, some of those power line pickups and enormous networks of, of data that really is the only way to, to, to capture and capture safely. Okay, so this this is a local company here. In, I'm, I'm based in Adelaide, South Australia, local company, uh, WGA. They've put a fair bit of their uh, work online on, on YouTube. Um, they do have an office in Melbourne, I should say, as well. Um, but they, uh, again, took on uh, the BLK uh, very quickly. They used it across um, their, their portfolio of work, including when you said about uh, cars, they scan helicopters to ensure that the helicopter can get back into its hangar and all the different types of sort of drooping that happens on the blades and just incredible. So, uh, and some of these remote areas need the storm shelters for the helicopters. So that's what they, they did. Um, it's, I think it's the most well-traveled BLK in history. Um, this is interesting. And I don't know if you've ever scanned a horse with a BLK 360, but uh, this is getting close to it. Granite Island's a very popular tourist destination, about uh, 70 kilometres south of Adelaide. Um, about 700,000 tourists visit the island a year. There was previously a, a timber causeway, which is around 140 years old, and uh, really getting to the point where it, it couldn't actually be repaired. One of the key objectives was to um, maintain that linkage to the island, um, but also give them a structure that was going to last 100 years with, with very limited maintenance. WGA provided all of the, the engineering components. That involved uh, the structural uh, bridge design, which included about 350 tonne of steel and over 4,000 tonne of concrete. Um, WGA also provided the maritime design, uh, so in terms of wave, wave loading, um, and also there was a, a boat loading facility uh, halfway along the causeway. We also provided geotechnical services for, for design of the piles. Um, WJ also provided uh, temporary works design support, um, which included getting 250 ton cranes out over the causeway we were building, um, and also a demolition of, of parts of the existing causeway. Point cloud scanning is critical to a project that has an existing structure in it. So we can use that to pick up exact details and get our new jetty as close as we could to the existing jetty, which avoided clashes on site and a lot of costs involved, it saved a lot of money for the client. The horse-drawn carriage is unique to Victor Harbour. It's one of a kind, not a single one in the world besides this location. There's no drawings, there's no sizes or anything like that. Um, so we went and used our point cloud scanner to scan the carriage inside and out to verify it actually fit on the jetty. You can measure these things with tape measure, but it's always open to errors. With our scanner, it's within two or three millimetres and you're never going to get it wrong. One of the challenges of this project was the remote location. There was little opportunity for, for cast in situ uh, due to schedules and programs and the remoteness. So we, we scanned this bridge, existing bridge, and we modelled the, the new bridge in order to get the precast elements exactly right and delivered on time and on budget. The scanning technology is an advantage of WJ gives us that critical edge um, in able to deliver these projects more efficiently than some of our competitors. Great outcome in the end for uh, the department um, to achieve that structure that, that is really going to have that low maintenance going forwards. So, Autodesk is, is famous for acquisitions. You're you're part of it, uh, part of the sort of um, being embraced into the into the beast. Um, the most recent one that's been announced is Point Fuse. Now, I personally haven't used Point Fuse, but I get a I get a fair understanding of what it does, and it really is moving across into that mesh uh, 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 output and trying to solve issues with how big these point clouds are. Um, I might just play this and then we'll have a quick chat about, uh, it's under my topic of future, of, of if that's a way, a way to go. Actually, I think that doesn't have any sound, so. You'll see from the, uh, an RTC, that's great. You'll see there's a, a scan, um, but what it's actually doing is, is encapsulating it with a, with a mesh, 
which then becomes lighter, so I'm told. It also has the capability of, uh, this is within the point fuse program itself, bearing in mind that we're not sure how point fuse will be integrated or used by Autodesk um, once the acquisition uh, is complete. Um, but it's about creating simple, quick geometry um, because not everyone can understand the point clouds sometimes, especially classification of point cloud is a, is a, is a pain. So to really go through and classify all your pipe work so that they can be then color coded or, or, or um, shown differently can be uh, quite problematic. Uh, I realized that Recap now has some classification in it, um, which is a good step, at least for, for understanding landform, vegetation, building, and having that as a separate uh, layers, for want of a better word. So given that both you and I don't know much about it, what do you think of point fuse? So <laughs> actually, I do know a bit about point fuse. <laughs> so uh, I, I managed our relationship uh, between point fuse and Leica, and we we sold a uh, you know a slightly modified white labeled version of of point fuse um, called point fuse powered by Jetstream, uh, yes. and and yeah. So one of the one of the big things that people you know were really using this for you know as you said um, the the you know kind of the core technology is is largely based around meshing and so um, one of the things that people would do would be you know use it as a as a fast avenue to get towards like an LOD 100 or 200 uh, BIM model. So, you know, get their structures, classify various points, um, uh, structures and, and objects, et cetera, you know, whether it's um, getting all the MEP systems and, and tagging all the pipes or, or objects. And then, yeah, they, they had released a, um, a Revit plugin, et cetera. I think it makes a ton of sense for, for Autodesk to have picked them up. Uh, my understanding is that it was mostly around acquiring the the core technology. So as a as a product, uh, Point Fuse. I I don't know. I'm not you know involved with this, but um, you know I would I would suspect that eventually um, just is consumed within the you know the Autodesk uh, ecosystem and possibly you know features added to uh, construction cloud or or something along those lines. I I would suspect it's not going to exist as a standalone product. Um, you know, into the future, I know there will be for some time, but but yeah, really. Like I said, using that um, you know classification and and meshing functionality, I think I think does make uh, make sense for for Autodesk to then you know build on top of some of the existing meshing capabilities that you know my my previous team had had worked on and and um, you know kind of in some ways pioneered and yeah you know, no, it's I, been, I, continued I to be built out for years, but I, I think this makes sense. And when we put it in the perspective of civil capture, civil engineering, mm -hmm. large scale, um, of course, it's mainly beam mesh, apart from that really high level LIDAR, which you know is extremely mm -hmm. uh, dense. Um, when trying to in, you know put an enormous, uh, say it's a road pickup over a corridor, a point cloud is is just a bit of a killer for for, for a lot of uh, mm -hmm. situations, especially within Revit. But when uh, the mesh, so even with our friends at Bentley, they, they, they did do a lot of this mm -hmm. meshing work very well. Um, and the output that can happen with some of these aerial acquisitions and even drone through PIX4D, and, and I've, yeah. I noticed a question that um, came up. I might get to that in a second. Um, so it's lighter. It's it's easier, it's lighter. It's just not, when people sort of zoom in, this is the, the classic, um, it's not quite as accurate. So it needs to be sort of read in that or understood in that context. Well, and one of one of my old go-to demos back, um, you know, back when I was, was on the recap side, um, you know, one of my kind of song and dance routines was showing how meshes can be combined with, with point clouds to provide context. So you think of, you know, maybe you've laser scanned a, a 
building, um, you know, but maybe you didn't get up to the roof. So you can use a drone and photogrammetry to fill in some of the, you know, rooftop uh, machinery or think of landscaping. Do you really want to spend, you know, the time to laser scan uh, a couple of uh, acres, et cetera, of, you know, gardens or something around a building? Or do you, you know, fly a drone, uh, make a quick mesh, align it with the point cloud, and then suddenly you have the the accuracy in the middle of that, um, you know, that building and any critical infrastructure that you've scanned, but then you can fill in the visuals of those, you know, attractive photo-based meshes or aerial LIDAR, et cetera. Um, and now you get the topology of the land, but you also get that, you know, kind of added visual pop of actually seeing what the rest of the site context looks like. Um, so oh, that was, really. you know. Uh, and and whenever in doubt, I can guess I remind my civil friends that a tin is a mesh anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, sort of coming at it from two different ways, but we're, we're creating a similar format. Now, when I mentioned PIX4D, so I didn't put that in uh, in, in the presentation. I should have. Um, we've got a question from John McIntosh who's asked, uh, what is the difference between a recap and programs like PIX4D for getting point clouds into civil 3D? I think what he's so, saying is if he's yeah. the, the PIX4D creator and, and manager tool, does PIX4D export RCP? I, I don't know, to be honest. I'm not sure either, no. But it would export a, it would, it would export a format that can be read by recap. So mm -hmm. um, definitely, I guess they're both consumption. You know, Pix4D is, is a creation and a consumption device. Recap is probably just a consumption in a way. And then you put it Well, in so, yeah. And, and previously, Recap, um, I'm, I'm not sure about the current state of it, but uh, Recap also had the, the photogrammetry aspect as well. Um, and, you know, at the time, at least, you know, when I was there, and this again was eight years ago or so uh, and beyond, uh, you know, Pix, Pix4D was certainly a, a competing photogrammetry product, but, but you know, a lot more uh, bells and whistles and knobs that you could adjust to, you know, do, do things that, you know, like I said, at the time, at least, um, Recap Photo, as it was then called, just, you know, was going above and beyond those capabilities. So, um, you know, both were were creating photorealistic meshes, et cetera. But, uh, but yeah, achieving some similar goals, uh, you know, through different methods. But, you know, yeah, Pix4D is certainly uh, a very, very popular option within the, you know, the market at large. Oh, look, I, I agree. Uh, and quite clever. I, I used it, uh, I, I scanned a school. Um, very quickly with an old uh, DJI, and I was amazed by how well it, it picked it up. On the other end of the scale, and especially with the, the beast of NVIDIA, things like mm -hmm. the NVIDIAverse, uh, Cesium tiles, I mean, they are not just city scale, they're almost world scale mesh uh, uh, creation mm -hmm. tools, and then environments to, to, to live in. Um, now, I, I, on that particular point, you saw in the, in the, email, the, the video from Citicorp, sorry, City Power, that they were visualizing the point clouds with headsets. Did you did you get to mm -hmm. that stage? It hadn't really seemed to be um, uh, supported, as, as in out of the box with mm -hmm. either Recap or Leica, but has that been looked at? Absolutely. So, I mean, uh, in in my Recap days, we had um, we had some photo-based versions. So if you remember, I think it was called the, uh, the Google Cardboard. It was a little contraption yep. that you'd slide your phone into and could make it into a little uh, virtual um, uh, virtual reality headset. And so we actually did have some, some demonstrations publicly of that sort of technology. You know, of course there were a number of, uh, internal skunk works products for as long as VR was, you know, even a, a thing that anyone knew anything about, but then also, you know, Leica as well, you know, we, uh, we had a, a VR product, um, VR point cloud viewer and and to this day still have a you know 3D um, VR 
point cloud uh, component um, that is part of the the TrueView uh, product right. line. But, but yeah. Yep, yep. And of course, just on LinkedIn the other day, someone got an expense account to buy some Apple glasses. So. <laughs> yeah, they're they're playing with uh, with the Vision Pro as yeah. as well from Apple and and all of that. So yeah, there's you know anything you can imagine is probably being played with on some level it's just a matter of you know whether whether any given project pans out and well i will, I will, of... show, I will show you this video then because it is um it the more i see it the more i like it so you know obviously the blk to go is this you know olympic torch type device um but you do have to worry about just how well it can pick up and 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 whereas this one this is the navis uh, and so this is actually from a company down in uh, Tasmania. Gandhi and Roberts Consulting Engineers provides structural, civil, hydraulic engineering services as well as BIM consulting. Our main clients are architects, builders and developers. And we always try to help them implement new technologies and processes to do their job better. I was first introduced to Point Clouds about 15 years ago in Germany on a project and the potential was amazing at the time. However, the technology was very hard to use and very expensive. During my last visit in Germany, my brother-in-law was actually using a Navis VLX system. When I saw this technology, I was just amazed by how easy it is to capture Point Clouds and to turn them around quickly to then also use the point clouds and present those point clouds to our clients. The, the exoskeleton, um, it looks like a bit like the thing from Aliens that Sigourney Weaver's in. Um, maybe not quite as big as that. Um, but I can, I can really see how it works very well. Stabilized, easy to interact with, uh, probably has a huge battery. Um, did you ever play with this or see it? So uh, one of the big things with that one, yeah, I mean, the, the form factor is is certainly one of the defining features, um, you know, in comparison to some of the other options. And uh, the cameras, the cameras are pretty nice on it uh, in terms of uh, the photo uh, photography that you're you're getting from it. Um, I didn't I didn't personally scan with one, but, you know, certainly as a competitor in the market, we were we were looking at what they were doing as well. Um, and, yeah, you know, I, I won't, you know advocate one way or the other but i've i've heard people who've liked it i've heard people who it certainly wasn't for them but um but yeah no definitely no um, i don't, I don't it's, want to put you on uh on, on this on the spot there i have heard that initially there was a bit of drift through acquisitions um mm -hmm. they've introduced a new um a coordination or or i guess even a, a, a you know, survey marker type technology where they sort of tap it on the ground and they can real realign. Yeah, you have to kind of kneel down and uh, yeah. tap the bottom of that chest plate to the ground. Yeah, it's kind of interesting, but <laughs> but um, uh, you know, look, great. I, I think I think these guys and these. This is a a company who probably wouldn't otherwise get into scanning, but for the for the for the benefit mm -hmm. they get out of out of this, which is um, um for those on the on the webinar who are in uh, Brisbane or can get there. Uh, so there's a Brisbane um, happening next Wednesday and the actual agenda I somehow lost, but uh, lost off this page, but it is including uh, Liam, uh, uh, who's going to be talking about point clouds. Uh, and I think there's a couple other presentations of the same sort of ilk. So uh, jump on, just just Google search Brisbane, you'll, you'll find that. Uh, it's always free um, and, and some really good um, uh, content uh, at, those, at those sessions. Uh, a thank you. Um, thank you, obviously, to the, the companies who I managed to showcase, uh, and certainly a thank you to Eric, who it's probably now past his bedtime, uh, but <laughs> certainly um, just to pull some of this information together and present it, uh, you know, I think I think it's just, uh, you know, we could go off and do a whole series on Aerial and, DJ, and DJI, mm -hmm. but um, this is where I think the rubber hits the, the road, so to speak, or the point clouds hit the... Uh, 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 the something uh, where our our um, customers are particularly interested in, in how they're going to use this in their workflow uh, and how they're going to acquire it. Not every customer of ours is going to go create their own point clouds, but they're certainly going to be involved in acquiring it, understanding the sort of the dif differences and what they're wanting 
to be um, uh, uh, as a deliverable. Certainly, coordination and geolocation is a big deal. That's a, that's a topic mm -hmm. on its own. Um, but I, I might flip back to Eric if he can. Uh, how good were you with uh, with geolocation in recap? Well, so <laughs> this was one of those things where we talked about the the differences in in customers, et cetera. Especially in the early days, it was uh, you know it was a struggle. It was a struggle to get a coordinate system into uh, into Recap, a geo coordinate system. Now it improved massively over the years, but yeah, especially in the early days, there were oh maybe one or two guys on the whole team that that could do it reliably. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that was definitely something that, you know, uh, it, it, it had some challenges at first, but um, yeah, they've certainly improved things over the years. So I'm glad it wasn't just me then. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's good. Because of course, you know, architects who are, I was mainly dealing with at the time would, it would, would be presented these point clouds that they didn't even really know why they asked for it, but they were just sort of told mm -hmm. to. A lot of times from developers who'd been uh, schooled up by, by other people, uh, they'd drop it into Revit and it just wouldn't be anywhere near. So uh, <laughs> there's this whole... And then if you told a surveyor, well, you know, in reality, Revit doesn't like anything over 30 miles and they would just... They couldn't stop laughing. So there was this... 90 degree angles for walls. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was quite a um, quite a, an effort to get it to accepted but uh, i think it is now so um no, that's great um i don't think i've got another slide do i no that's it so i really um i'm gonna go back to the quick the q a i do see a red no that's answered so that's great okay um again i'm happy to take questions offline uh, via the via the email that you would have received for the zoom or or training at civil survey or, or my email address which is sort of plastered everywhere um but um Eric, what's next? You've uh, uh, got a, a few plans or still involved with some development? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of doing my own thing for a little bit and uh, figuring out where I'm headed, what I, what I want to do next. Um, right now, I'm, I'm working on uh, scuba certification, of all things. Oh, right. <laughs> you know, having, having a little fun for myself. Uh, while well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll pick on this uh, uh, offline. I do have a good friend who actually is a marine archaeologist, and she uses photogrammetry underwater. Yep, absolutely. It's absolutely. And, and subsea LIDAR is also a thing. Uh, it turns into a fish fry sometimes, but uh, that's also <laughs> a thing I've seen in action. <laughs> So I didn't, I didn't think you could do it, but apparently it, it works. I guess you have to triangulate yep. the thickness of the water or the fluidity, but um, they do it for shipwrecks. It's incredible. Absolutely. Yep. Well, good. Keep, keep, we'll keep in touch for, for that as well. Thanks, Eric. Um, I will <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll send you through the results of this and uh, we'll chat soon. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.